what you research is really, really interesting, and uh, this is how we're going to start it out. I, I'm not sure if I was the first one, doctor, but I was. I may have been the first one. This was back in the 80s, back in the 1980s. I actually went on the air. I don't know whether you know this is true or not. You can go back. People can go back and uh, find the show, either the late 80s or early 90s. And somebody called me on the phone. That's what you do on a talk show. And they said, uh, Art, something about Nelson Mandela. And I said, well, Nelson Mandela died, didn't he? I actually said that on the air. And um, I had never heard anything of a so-called Nelson Mandela effect or Mandela effect before, and maybe it was before that, but it's the first I had ever heard of it. Actually, when I said it on the air, that doesn't mean I was the first to say it, and I'm not claiming that. I'm just claiming that's the first I ever heard of it. I thought Nelson Mandela had died. Right. Uh, um, and you are actually researching something you call the Mandela effect. Am I right? Right. Well, it's um, I've been calling it the alive again phenomena before the the term Mandela effect became quite popularized. And um, because I, like you, I've been noticing sometimes people, or in my case, a cat had passed away and then the cat was alive again. So it, it could be a celebrity um, in the case of Nelson Mandela. What's really interesting about the Nelson Mandela situation is that we, this year, 2015, have reached kind of a tipping point where there are something like... Um, Maybe about 30% of the people asked, do you remember Nelson Mandela passed away when he was still incarcerated? Um, people, about 30% of the people believe that they do remember that. And then you, um, the best I way to know. ask these I, questions, of course, is to ask, um, when did a person die without tilting it one way or the other? Right. So, but no, you're correct. Um, now, you said 30%. What could possibly affect everybody in such a mass, seemingly time-shifting or twisting, I don't even know how to put it, way. I, what, what are we talking about here? Well, the actual figure that I got in my survey conducted in 2013 was 27%. So I'm saying, you know, it's pretty, that's pretty high. It's more than a quarter. And so what seems to be going on, and this is the reason I've been taking a look at it for so long, is that we're witnessing alternate histories. And that really gets interesting because it seems like time is not what we think it is. Facts may not be what we think they are. And if someone can be dead and then die a second time or be alive again, <laughs> as um, you know, lots of people are reporting this phenomenon. And it's not just Nelson Mandela. Interestingly, just today, I heard about uh, someone wrote me an email and mentioned that they thought Freeman Dyson had passed away, you know, about six, seven years ago. And actually, I sort of remembered that, too. Um, as of earlier today, he was still alive. So hopefully he's alive to see that, that his name is being mentioned in conjunction with this amazing find with the um, this KIC 8462852 yeah. <laughs> situation. So what we're noticing is that lots of things can change. And we... We seem to take it in stride when people have a spontaneous remission of disease. Well, we might be happy, of course, if it's our loved one that no longer has cancer and it's inexplicably cleared up. And this did happen to my grandmother. So I've had a personal case in my family of witnessing this. And I've known other people as well that have had these amazing spontaneous remissions without any kind of medical intervention. And so that's another case of alternate history. And it's the kind of thing... That is studied at places like well, Institute wait, of wait a minute, Sciences. Wait a minute. Hold on a sec. Um, you said if somebody has a uh, spontaneous remission, it is like an alternate history? I, how so? I understand the Mandela thing effect uh, and what you're talking about. I, I don't understand how it relates to a spontaneous remission. Okay. Well, this is what where it gets interesting. It's um, It has to do with the way – like I said, facts and events could actually be different. And, and so it starts getting important to keep a logbook or a ledger that includes three points in time, like X, Y, Z. 
So when you right. notice, like you did in the 1980s, that would be point Y, the bifurcation point. And that would be we'd mark it down. Art Bell in the late 1980s, so whatever date that was, remembered that Nelson Mandela had died at point X, which was, I don't know what date you remember. And then the the Z point would be the date that you record it. So that's why three times matter. And then later, you can record another event. Um, you, for example, Nelson Mandela might pass away again, as he did for some of us recently. And that seems unusual because now, you know, something – you don't expect someone to die twice. So it's, it's – um, you can, again, notice at this point in time, I heard that he had died at point X, and I'm hearing it here on um, day Y and recording it on day Z. All so right. Okay somebody to, to uh, somebody will go but back. The, the similarity you're asking about – why, how is this similar to spontaneous yes. remission? Uh, some, so, yes, I am. Uh, but somebody will go back, please, and find what show that was and what year. I'd, I'd love to know. Somebody will tell me. Uh, go ahead. Okay. So a spontaneous remission would be an example, uh, which is similar to death in a sense. Uh, we'll, we'll take the case of my grandmother. She was diagnosed with inoperable liver cancer when they were doing some exploratory surgery to check out adhesions in her intestinal area. Right. So what they found out, and everything matched. They matched the, the tissue sample with the CAT scans, with the blood tests, and it all came back saying uh, she would be dead of liver cancer um, pretty much within six months' time. Right. And she was in her, you know, she was quite elderly, so she chose to have no chemotherapy, no surgery. and But she was very spiritual, so lots of people prayed for her. And then the next thing that happened is when she went in for one of the routine checkups, they were checking the blood constantly. They didn't see the usual signs and evidence of cancer in the system. So they took another set of CAT scans. And that's when the doctors were stunned to report, you have no trace whatsoever of any kind of liver cancer. Wow. And they have no way to explain it. You know, that kind of a complete remission within just a couple months' time. So what do the doctors say? I mean, he sees evidence of impending uh, mortality, and then uh, just a short while later, no evidence whatsoever. Sadly, a good friend of mine got the same diagnosis and didn't last six weeks uh, with liver Sorry. cancer. Um, but what, I mean, I would demand, <laughs> wouldn't you, some kind of medical explanation for how that could possibly be? <laughs> well, actually, the doctor looked at my grandmother. She, she is such a spiritual woman. She was. And and so she was smiling as he was just looking completely baffled. So he had no explanation to give her. But she knew because she was a woman of faith that obviously she was Lutheran and very firmly believed that God absolutely delivers this kind of miracle. So for her, it was obvious. To me, looking at it from the scientific standpoint, I don't see much difference between someone coming back to life and completely going into, I mean, completely clearing out all the cancer cells from their liver within just a couple of months. That is very fast. I mean, it's inexplicably fast. It's, and there's no mechanism to explain exactly what happened other than to say that um, some of the same kinds of quantum phenomena that we witness on the microscopic scale could absolutely be happening in our daily lives as well. I go farther. I, I, I'd say impossible. And yet I know these things, <laughs> they do happen. Uh, it's just impossible, though. We, we, know, we all know what cancer is. It doesn't spontaneously completely disappear, and yet it does. And so uh, if you were to reach out for any sort of explanation that might make sense to anybody, what, what would it be? Well, this is what I'm proposing, and it's just my, it's just what I have so far. It's because I'm definitely uh, looking to science and saying, you've got some explaining to do here. Yeah, explaining. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I really am looking as um, much as I can to find out what's going on. And thank goodness uh, that we have scientists such as Dr. Yasunori Nomura at UC Berkeley, and he and Rafael Busso have both been working with the Large Hadron Collider. And I know Yasunori, I interviewed him recently, and he has a um, basically an outlook that says that the many worlds of the multiverse is the same thing as, um, you know, the, uh, the, the the many worlds of, excuse me, I got that a little backwards. The many worlds of quantum physics is the same thing as the multiverse. So he's bringing the, the quantum to the macroscopic scale and saying 
that it could be that time all exists around us and then these bifurcations in time happen in kind of little pockets near us. So things can change. Okay. In fact, I, I, the interesting thing about Yasunori is I swear he didn't exist when I was writing my book, Quantum Jumps, or I definitely would have mentioned all of the amazing papers he's written. Okay. But, um, and all that's right. another example. Someone right. who doesn't uh, seem to exist and then suddenly, suddenly they do. Suddenly exist. So I, all right. I can tell him that? Okay. Do you actually believe or suspect that CERN, uh, the Large Hadron uh, Collider, actually might be responsible for these uh, shifts in that we're talking about right now? Well, it certainly is bringing people's awareness to the possibility of many worlds, of many possible realities, and of them just getting their minds going that direction. But so why, from why that the collider? Why the collider? Well, uh, there, there is a lot of uh, actually public awareness. I think that does make a difference because what I've noticed in 2015 is that finally people are noticing things um, like the Berenstain Bears. Uh, this, that famous children's book, and they're noticing the spelling of it. Like if if you just list, listeners right now, ask yourself, how do you spell? If you know this book with the bears, it's a family of bears. They're drawn as cartoons. How would you spell Berenstein Bears? S T I A N at the end, right? S T, and then you said E I N. Uh E I N. I think yes. That's I'd also what guess. I remember. And that's currently not the case. If you look at any of the children's books, you'll see that they're all spelled S-T-A-I-N. Really? Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Are, are you suggesting the um, large collider is somehow directly responsible for these time shifts? Or are you suggesting people's awareness of, of the amazing things this collider is doing, uh, you know, the fact that they're, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, hold on, please. We're at a break point. 